I'm Van Sebastian, here with my co-host, S.A. Baz Collins, for this week's Written on the Edge, Season 9, Episode 8 interview. We'll be talking with Larry Duplachan and discussing his latest book. So if you didn't hear our previous interview with him, let's get to know our guest. Larry is the author of five novels, including Blackbird, which is considered the first modern Black coming out novel, and the Lambda Literary Award-winning Got Till It's Gone, plus the movie memoir, Movies That Made Me Gay. His hobbies include singing, playing the ukulele, reading show business biographies, and pursuing his ongoing quest to forestall the physical aging process and build truly outstanding pecs. He lives in Los Angeles with his husband of 47 years and a chartreuse cat named Mr. Blue. Larry, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Nice to see you guys. Great to You're see you adorable. also. Mm. Aww. Thanks. So, Tell me more about my eyes. My eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to encourage people to go listen no, to our first- No, we never first... get each other's references. It's terrible. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. It's, it's awful. Oh. So I am going to encourage people to listen to our first interview with you so they can hear how you got into writing. And instead, I'm going to ask what you've been up to in the past couple of years. I wrote a book. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did. Movies that made me gay. Um, since I, I don't think I had retired when I last talked to y'all. And nope. um, so I, I was a legal secretary for 40 plus years and I retired at the end of 2021. And it was on my retirement to do list to write a memoir of some kind. And so this is like, how I spent my summer vacation. So this is what I've been doing kind of since I, since I retired from the hurly burly of uh, secretarying for attorneys. And um, since its publication in October of 2023, I've mostly been pouring myself hither and yon, trying to get <laughs> people to review the book and, 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 you know, and read it and, and one hopes uh, buy it, just getting out in front of that. The whole marketing process is so different since mm -hmm. the last time I published, which was 15 or 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole new world and in many ways, not a particularly friendly one. Right. <laughs> no. Amen. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's most of what I've been doing is writing and then um, trying to publicize this book <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and feeding my I can't and knitting and, you know, occasionally boinking my husband. And that's my life for the well, past few years. Sounds wonderful to me. Sounds like a great life. A guy can yeah. do worse, frankly. <laughs> right, right, right. So if I saw you at a book fair signing this memoir and I said, hey, what's this about? What would be your elevator pitch to me? First of all, you know, if you know of any, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do uh, su such an event, which, you know, they just aren't out there anymore. But um, depending on who I thought you were, mm -hmm. I, I, I might say, hey, do you love the Wizard of Oz? Hey, I do. Um, <laughs> it's kind of why Dorothy is on the cover. It's, it's, it's a, a way- Books are go. awfully decorative. <laughs> Should have done it I can't tell you how that, I, <laughs> we're never going to get through this. I know. Um, this, this book is a love, letter to movies that old movies mostly um, that most of them I've loved since I was a kid um, and they are movies that I think uh, helped to nurture my gay sensibility um, my somewhat bitchy Eve Arden sense of humor um, movies that I come back to again and again and again sometimes several times in any given year oh yeah um, and uh, another big chunk of the book is about uh, my personal holiday film festivals. There are movies that I watch every year um, at certain uh, parts of the year. Right now, it's February. I'm in the middle of my uh, Black History Month film festival. Nice. And then Easter and Pride Month and Fourth of July and Halloween and Christmas. And um, that's that's what the, the second big chunk of the book is about. By that time, you've probably walked away. Um, but that's what <laughs> I want to tell you. <laughs> I would not have. I love both movies and memoirs. So you, know, you, still, you still have me. I, I think, well, you I know, think, if, I, think if, I think you if, should if you definitely do. 
I think you should definitely, you know, get this out there for for the kids to like start up movies that made me gay parties, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need well, to trend this girl. As, as I as, as I say, it kind of depends on 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 how you uh how you presented you know to me if if you seem to be gay male and even slightly interested i you know i might you know i might give you the peck pop of love or or you know pop a bicep or something to keep your attention while i'm talking about the book but you know i i, I do what i i do what i have to do love it love it love it so what are some of the films i mean obviously the covers wizard of oz what are some of the other films that you've highlighted in the memoir and are there any lessons attached to them that you want to share cripes there are a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> it's almost 400 pages long and it's all about movies hey um you know different movies for different parts of my life and mean different things to me you know the wizard of oz i thought was almost universal i have discovered since the book's uh, publication that there are some people who hate it which took me by surprise but yeah right um okay uh, there's uh didn't you know, know that poppins, was a thing <laughs> uh, mary poppins which was my first the first movie I ever obsessed about. I'm seven years old and I'm going back every weekend to see this movie. Um, I fell in love with Julie Andrews who became my first diva. Um, you know, then there's uh, Valley of the Dolls which I probably was 11 or 12 years old when I first, first saw that. Lord, um, girl. You know, which was my introduction to how wonderful a truly bad movie can be. Mm -hmm. um, it really was kind of my uh, introduction to capital C camp. Uh, there's, you know, down to the, the boys in the band, which I saw in, in college, um, which play I had read in high school and which was my very first piece of gay literature. It was in fact, my first piece of gay art of any sort. Wow. So, you know, different movies, different parts of life, different, uh, different purposes, you know, in the development of um, me. Mm -hmm. Do you have the memoir broken up uh, like chapter per movie or is it more topical per chapter? Depends. Uh, oh. Again, uh, di different, different things for different movies. The, um, the, the parts about the holidays, obviously, um, those are larger uh, chapters. And then there will be sort of, you know, little chapterettes within those chapters. Um, the, the first part of the book, which really is the part uh, of movies that made me gay um kind of kind of per chap uh, a chapter uh, uh per film uh because those 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 films are uh quite seminal in my in my development and so i, I do spend more time on them than, than than i necessarily do in the the second part of the book for some of those movies i think also as queer people movies were an escape from <clears throat> the, what could bring us down and which is one of the reasons why, as we've demonstrated in this interview so far, that we hone in on lines from films because I think because we didn't get to do, have those, you know, romantic interactions as we were developing and stuff. It taught us how we're supposed to react in many respects, you know, as we grew up. So we found our way as queer people through those films in a way that I don't think straight people necessarily have the same parallel because for us, we had to adapt and translate in order to make it workable for us. Do you know what I mean? Well, you had me at the word escape uh, because for me as a black gay child, um, I was pretty miserable. Just, mm. just kind of on a just kind of on a general basis in, in a way that a child really shouldn't have to be miserable and mm -hmm. you know there's a chunk of uh, of the first part of the book about the busby berkeley musicals of, of uh, 1933 and and afterwards uh, which i loved when i was about 11 12 years old and those were a huge escape into a world that it was not only quite unlike the world i grew up in but probably never really existed um, it was an absolute and utter black and white fantasy. And it, it was uh, a 90 minute get me away from being this little black, effeminate, skinny, miserable child. Um, and in terms of, uh, of translation, I think the fact that so many gay men, not all of us, because I'm going to get letters now, but so many gay men identified with the women 
in these movies, rather than I certainly was much more Katherine Hepburn than I than I was Cary Grant. As much as I loved Cary Grant, um, it was Hepburn, it was Betty Davis, it was Ginger Rogers, it was the it was the gals who I identified with, who I talked like, who I still talk like. I mean, you know, Eve Arden in Stage Door is still my patronus, you know, to this day. Um, uh, because you know we didn't have uh, uh, we didn't have Billy Porter we didn't have uh, mm -hmm. uh, NPH we did not have you know gay guys on the screen for us to go oh yeah I well like until that. Boys in the Band was probably the first instance where that really started to happen because then you had a little bit of the snipe a little bit of the 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 uh, uh, digs that that we would see if these strong women have in these previous movies it was suddenly gay men who had those lines they were a bit more biting than usual um but i think that you know again it wasn't till you started seeing boy and i guess that's why boys in the band is such a pivotal moment in queer cinema because yeah. it was and the again first i understand and you know in, in in my essay about boys in the band i admit to understanding why some gay men hate it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah for me at my age, because it was 1972 when I first read it, and what I saw wasn't a room full of gay men being beastly to each other. I saw I saw a room full of gay friends, and I didn't have any yet. So mm -hmm. the mere fact that there was such a thing somewhere out there, there were guys getting together and having these <laughs> apocalyptic uh, birthday parties, uh, meant there were people like me. Right. I might be able to meet some someday. And boy, are they ever witty. And they love the same movies I love. And they quote the same movies. Mm -hmm. That's what I that's what I saw. And I, I and I, I and I quote David David Ehrenstein, um, who said, um, there's meanness, but there's also love. Yep. These yep. guys mm -hmm. clearly, these guys clearly love each other. They're a dysfunctional family, but they're a family. We're all over the place today, aren't we? Well, you know, that's fine. Uh, There's what a I theme. Gotta know, There's what, a theme. Yeah. What I got to know is in, in the spirit of our patron saint of Broke Podcast, Rosalind Russell, did the women or Auntie Mae make the list? Neither of those. Uh, well, uh, Auntie Mae, one of my very favorite movies, did not make the book because it didn't fit in because it didn't fit into the structure. Um, ah, OK. Uh, All About Eve also didn't make the book. Probably, maybe my second or third favorite movie. Um, again, because it didn't fit the structure, I didn't see them until college. Ah, okay. So they weren't seminal in that sense and they're not holiday related. So they didn't fall into the category of holiday film festivals. Um, I, I have jokingly say, if this book sells even decently, I can write a sequel called, these are the ones I forgot. <laughs> you know, or something <laughs> like that. Because there's a whole world of <laughs> movies that I love that didn't, you know, it's 400 pages as it is. This is going to be like, you know, uh, like Mame says, like boxed like Proust. I had to <laughs> stop somewhere. Uh, uh, the women snuck in because uh, uh, Stage Door, uh, 1937, mm -hmm. Gregory LaCaba, RKO, um, is my favorite movie, all time favorite Hollywood movie and because they're so similar I snuck the women in right after right well, after there you stage go. door yep. because I, I actually think and I have no documents to prove this but I actually believe that at RKO they thought we couldn't get the rights to the women so we're going to make one of our own oh good point I, I, I could see that, that way. Yeah, yeah, I can because, see that. Because the, 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 because the play that it's allegedly based on is nothing like the movie and that's what that's what makes me think um, th that they were thinking we're going to make our own the women before they, before MGM can get theirs out there, and of course they did. Nice. There you go. All right. Is there anything else about the memoir you want to share with the world that we didn't think to ask? It's super fun, and you should buy it. You should. Um, <laughs> it's it's really fun, and much to my surprise. Uh, straight people are enjoying it and women are enjoying it black folks are enjoying it some of them um <laughs> and uh <laughs> my black readership has always been sketchy um 
I, I, I think when you, when you deal in minority literature, and I, of course, have always dealt with double minority literature, right. mm -hmm. everybody wants you to have written a certain book. And their, their story. Just, just the other day, a guy uh, out of the blue, total rando, messaged me on, on Facebook and said, you only like white men. What about brothers? And I was like, hi, you, and you are? <laughs> yeah, right, right, girl. <laughs> And he had and he had somehow gleaned this from this book. And I literally because and because my ego is so fragile, I literally got out my own galley proofs and started going through it and going, oh, no, no, I definitely talk about black men in here. And I definitely talk about handsome black men in here. And I did that because but no matter what it is, somebody is going to go, but you should have done this. And right. my answer right. Unless, unless my answer is bite me, which it sometimes is, my answer is usually you're right. Someone should write that book. You write that book. Yes, um, exactly, exactly. Well said. If those kind of kind of questions and points often are more about them than it is about what you've done. You know? It's always more about them. And right. as, as uh, I can't I can't remember who said it, but it's in the uh, the uh, celluloid closet documentary oh it's the the fellow who wrote the, uh, the the screenplay to rebel without a cause nobody no two people ever see the same movie yes. no two people ever read the same book that yep. is true because because you bring yourself to the work but after you know i'm six books in i've been doing this for 35 years and you know if one more black gay man comes up to me telling me what book i should have written i i'm not responsible for my actions <laughs> Because enough already. <laughs> you, you know, I I think I have your your elevator pitch. It's like the celluloid closet, only with many more feather boas and sequins. <laughs> well, I give I try to give Vito Russo his due props in it. There is a chapter about Vito, who was a friend of mine, and and the celluloid closet, both the book and the movie. Because clearly, if you're gay and you're writing about movies, you owe Vito Russo two props. So there was mm -hmm. no way he was going to mm -hmm. stay out of the book. Um, and my husband keeps saying, you need to do, you need to go out and do presentations like Vito's. Like, hmm. <laughs> but, you know, there's a TED Talk there. There's a say, there's your TED Talk. You heard it here first, people. Yeah, breaking news. yeah set that up. <laughs> <laughs> How else so, are you going to get Netflix involved? <laughs> tell me how. All that, right. that, of course, that, of course, is the dream of my life currently. So if you know anybody there. All right. Okay, I'll get them on the line as soon as we're done. If you would. <laughs> so uh, the book came out in October. Obviously, yeah. it was in your editor's hands way before that, just given how book cycles Not are. way, really. Really? I actually, no, I actually turned in my first draft in February oh. of 2023. Wow. So, so only um, a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that might nullify my next question. Uh, I was going to ask if you've seen anything since the book left your hands that you felt should have been in it. Well, you know, we've kind of we've kind of covered that that question. There there are okay. you know there are there are movies that that just didn't make the cut for, um, you know, for 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 good reason. Usually, I mean, if I if I were writing the book to if I were even editing the book today mm -hmm. i would mention rustin um because i there there is a little uh bit uh in the uh in, in the gay pride month section about the documentary uh, mm -hmm. brother outsider and um so yeah i would definitely have slipped uh rustin uh in for for honorable mention because it's good mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah. <clears throat> yeah exactly but, oh, well, that's, but that's just a that's just a matter of of you know uh, like like sand, you know, like sands in the hourglass, because there are movies in the book that maybe shouldn't have made it because of when they came out. But I had to write about Bros, um, and so Bros is in the book, in spite of the fact that it was neither a seminal work for me nor something that I've seen many times. Simply because I write about several uh, gay romantic comedies in a row, and that one was the most recent one. So I literally mm -hmm. go. I kind of have to write about this, so here it is. 
So, you know, you make those decisions as you go along. Right, exactly. All right. Anything well, else from you? What I think is interesting is that, it, you know, you, and, and I'm just going to sneak this question here at our, our closest ahead. point. Um, sometimes I find that I will rediscover a film that I watched that had an influence on me, but I has gotten lost in the dustbin in the back of my head and I'll discover it and go, oh my God. I really loved this film when I was a child, you know, and you, you kind of rediscover those little gems. So maybe there's a hidden gems one that, you know, you can sneak in there sometime. Book well, as, as I've said to my, to my publisher, Ricky Beetle Blair, whom I adore and who is pushing me to do a sequel, there is no incentive to write a sequel to a flop. So I'm kind of waiting <laughs> to see. <laughs> well, girl, we got to get you on that Ted talk and we got to get yeah. you with the Netflix people. <laughs> Glory, make it happen. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> All right. So I noticed that your bio didn't mention one of the hobbies that I know about you, and you happen to be wearing one of the works. How is your knitting going? I knit every day. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> and I've been knitting every day for for seven years, um, but I give everything away. You know, I'll finish something, and I'll. Sh- I mean, you we're Facebook friends, so you know this. I'll finish yeah. something, and go look what I made. Who wants it? And somebody always does. And so I'm usually either um, knitting a request or you know, when I finish, I'll go, hey, first person who says I want this gets it. And um, I happen to have just finished this hat. Love it. Ah, love it. Love, uh, love it. Uh, and decided well, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fabulous. Yeah. It's absolutely fabulous. Now, what I need to see <laughs> is you and Tom Daly sitting poolside knitting and chatting. <laughs> Yeah, please note, I was a knitter before Tom Daly. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> because I know everybody thinks, oh, you did it because I know. No. no. <laughs> well, this seems like yeah. a perfect point to encourage people to go to your Facebook at Larry Duplichan, follow you, see what you're up to. Because you also talk about movies and you talk about iconic movie figures as well as your, I mean, your Facebook page is a testament to our culture. Thank you. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I'm the Perfect. only Larry Duplichan on Instagram, so you can find me there. Nice. Uh, Perfect. All right. Excellent. Are you ready for a get-to-know-you questions? Sure. Okay. Take it away, Bez. In this year of diving deeper, what's your favorite writing snack or drink? Um, I don't. Oh, you know, okay. I always have a bottle of water nearby, but but that's really it. Hydrate, I'm, girl. I'm a, Hydrate. Yeah, I'm not. I'm 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 real. I'm not really a eat and write kind of. Kind of okay. Guy. All right. Well, what books did you grow up reading? I started reading when I was about two and a half. And so it's a little blurry from, from here. Um, I know I read uh, Tom Sawyer. I know I read the Henry Huggins books by Beverly Cleary. Um, I know I read uh, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, but then, you know, but then I got silly. I start, you know, I read Valley of the Dolls when I was 10. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it, it's, I didn't really read the books that were appropriate to my age necessarily. <laughs> well, that's current in a nutshell, you know. <laughs> and make no mistake, I understood about half of that book when I read it <laughs> right. for the first time. But I felt so naughty doing it that it, it was worth it just to, to have it in my hand and have people look at me like, what is with this kid? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, who's been the biggest supporter of your writing? me oh well there you go I'm, i've really i've really had to be my own cheer squad um for really what is all of all of what is laughingly called my writing career um my husband is supportive in that he doesn't try to keep me from doing it but it's not like he was constantly saying oh get in there and write another book um because <laughs> it's 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 a lo- it's a lonely endeavor it um, is when i was writing i think it was Ka- I think it was Tangled Up in Blue. Um, one of my earlier books, he he nearly divorced me because he said I saw your I saw your back for a year. Um, <laughs> so I I wrote movies that made me gay largely behind his well not behind his back but I'd be sitting in bed watching TV with my iPad and just typey 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 type, type. So I was I was sitting in the room uh, with him so he didn't feel neglected. Um, <clears throat> however, I, I hasten to add that when he did read it in galleys uh, when he finished it um greg came into the room where i was knitting 
and said, and it simply said, baby, it's a tour de force. Dropped oh, to the floor go. and walked away. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, you can't get better than that. All right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? I have kind of a golden hour zone between like, <laughs> between like 10 in the morning and three in the afternoon. Um, when I'm really, I get most of my stuff done during that time. I have to get up in the morning because I have a 17 year old diabetic cat and I have to get up and give him an insulin shot and give him his first meal and da 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 da. So he has made me, a, so he's made me a, a morning person. Um, but I'll also, you know, we're seniors, so we're sitting in bed at nine o'clock and the lights are out by nine 30. So <laughs> my night all days are very much over. All right. <laughs> well, what's your favorite hobby outside of writing? I, I'm a singer. I'm primarily a singer. And if you, if you go to YouTube and put in my name, there are many, many, many videos of me singing with my, with my ukulele, without it in church, outside of church, in my living, no, no, no. Um, and that's what I was supposed to do with my life. I was supposed to be, you know, the Billy Porter of the 1980s, but th the world didn't want a Billy Porter in the 1980s. So to me, so, so writing is really the hobby. Excellent. Okay. Um, what has writing and publishing a book changed the way you see yourself? No, this is my sixth book. Uh, so this is just, <laughs> this is, you know, this is something I do when I feel like it, and, you know. So yeah, the schedule's was, totally I, on you. Yeah, I was happy. I had the most fun I've ever had writing this book. And my editor, uh, John Russell Gordon, was probably, if anyone's ever been a cheer squad for me, it was him, because I sent him the chapters as I wrote them. Mm. And so he would get that first read out of the way, chapter by chapter by chapter. And he was really great about encouragement because I reached the point where I was like, you're not BSing me, are you? You really like it this much? Because he really, really liked it from, from Gat. Um, so so that, that was really cool. But you know, none of that really affected Larry Dublachet as a person. Because you know, like I said, I'm, I'm an old man now. I've been doing this for, you know, for a lifetime. So it's just something I do. Okay. Um, well, this may not apply to the book you've currently written, but maybe Hit something it. you've written. It, maybe it's something you've written before. If you were to write a spin-off about a side character, which would you pick? Oh, that's hmm. Either uh, Marshall McNeil from Blackbird. Um, I could follow that character becoming a. Uh, becoming a DP and you know maybe have him win an Oscar and da da da, da and have him uh, you know see what happens Journey. with him or um, or or I could I could rewrite Blackbird from the uh, point of view of Johnny Ray Russo's mother. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's, it's it's 1974 and I'm a middle aged black woman in a town I don't like with a husband I don't like and my child has just told me he's gay. Go. You know, so that, that there's a story there. Right, right. And no one's that ever asked go. me that question before. That's a great question. Okay, well, I'm glad I threw it back in. All right. Have you ever traveled as research for your books? No. Okay. How do you celebrate when you finish a book? I just move on to the next project. I probably picked up my knitting after I <laughs> after I sent the uh, after I sent yeah. that, okay. uh -huh, after I sent that first draft to John Gordon. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I'm working on a I'm working on a scarf. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's not like it. I probably celebrated after I finished my first novel, but you know. Do you remember what you did back then? <laughs> probably boinked my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I was 28. What can I tell you? <laughs> it, wor it works for me. It works for me. Well, you made it through the list. Bravo. <laughs> So do you have plans for a next project? No, no, okay. I don't. Like I said, if, if she this, says, if, and then a year later, <laughs> if the, no, if, the, if this book is even vaguely uh, popular and, and sells a few copies there, I could, it, I could, I could really do a series, <clears throat> you know, 
just yeah. uh, there's another movie book just waiting to happen. Um, Ricky Beetle Blair wants me to do one about pop music and then do another one about television, you know, so. Um, but as I said, I, I, I'm not writing sequels to a flop. <laughs> um, so I'm, we recently started uh, going to a, a little church near where, where we live. And the first thing I asked when I walked in was, do you have a prayer shawl ministry at this church? Because I'm a knitter. And the lady I was talk, talking to said, you're a knitter? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, congratulations, you're the prayer shawl ministry. Um, so, <laughs> well, there you go. So, so that's where my knitting is going to be going for a while. So, you know. That's probably what I'll be doing. My next, my next big project is probably a shawl. Oh, there Love you it. go. Love and, it. And check your follow his Facebook and his Instagram so you can see mm -hmm. what that looks like. There you go. And you had mentioned your music on YouTube. Do you have a YouTube channel or is just other mm -hmm. stuff? Other people? Okay. We'll need to get that link from you so we can share it. Just, just search Larry Duplishan on YouTube. Okay. And do. One thing about this name is it's probably going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. The chances of you're tripping over someone else with this name are really, really small. So. Perfect. All right. Any final words of wisdom? Buy this book. Buy the I swear, book. I swear go, I'm gonna go I'm gonna play Amazon. a fanfare every time you do that. <laughs> go to Amazon and order this book. It's I'm um, getting oh, mine. I know what I've forgotten to say. Um, yes. Very soon. Wait for it. Tick tick tick. Uh, the audio book will be out. So I'm excited about that, read by the author. Um, and I have no sense of modesty about it. It's really fun. I did a good job. Well, there you go. <laughs> so um, yeah, so go to Amazon. You can get it in print. You can get the Kindle edition. And soon you'll be able to get the audio book. So, so watch out for that. Perfect. All right, folks, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to Larry Duplichan for coming back and sharing with us the book he'd said he wasn't going to write because last then we talked to him, he said he was done. Ha, we got a memoir out of him. <laughs> we at Written on the Edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. So if you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media, please like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes. The show was produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listen stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.rotepodcast.com. Tune in next week for your queer media fix. Closing time. The bums rush and melody, dear. <laughs> <laughs>